Welcome to the Madison Miller Podcast. Today is Tuesday, May 26th, 2020. Today I'm going to talk about the latest news in sports related to the coronavirus, including important information in the National Hockey League. We'll go over the KBO results from the last few days and look ahead to tomorrow's slate. NASCAR will recap the races from the week and from yesterday and we'll preview and pick tonight's truck race and we will talk about the reruns that have been on TV lately in sports my 2013 NFL redraft and my 2015 top 10 songs okay first we'll talk about the virus um, Gary Bettman will speak today at 430 referring to the league's plan to come back including the 24 team playoff which looks like it's a done deal um the 24 team thing we've talked about a lot on the show um it's something that is neat in my opinion it's different um the newest round, like the new first round, is kind of like a wild card round. I think it's going to be like a best of five type of situation. Um, the top two teams in each division are getting a bye. And the third place division teams and the wild card teams, as well as the um, eight additional teams, will. Um, be participating in it and uh, in the wild card round, the new round, where it's, I think, going to be best of five. And then the winner of that series will go and play the team that's getting a bye in the best of 16, which would really be the first round of a normal playoffs. Um, there's a lot of teams that are good. That's going to be in the postseason that um, could have missed out in a regular year and some teams in weaker divisions that are going to be in the postseason because of the new format. I'm going to have John Buchacross on my show before the season resumes so we can talk about how this is going to play out and um, predictions and whatnot. So that is going to be something to keep an eye on. Um, so the play-in series would be in the East, Pittsburgh versus Montreal. Pittsburgh is your five. Montreal is the 12. The Hurricanes and the uh, and the Rangers, I almost said the Islanders. The Rangers, your 11 seed. Carolina, your 6 seed. Your 7-10 is Islanders, Panthers. Islanders as your 7, Panthers as your 10. And the Maple Leafs and the Blue Jackets be your 8 and 9. That's a very good series in the East. And so is Rangers Canes as well. Those two are really good series in the first round in the East. Or in the new first round, I should say. And then your 5 12 in the West is Oilers Blackhawks. Your 6 11 is Predators Coyotes. Your 7 10 is Canucks Wild. And your 8 9 is Flames Jets. Flames Jets is good. I like that series a lot. And then I think the seeding is based on a point percentage. So that's why the Islanders, although if the 16-team playoff um, is or was to happen, the Islanders wouldn't have been in it, but it's due to point percentage, and that's why they're in. And um, the only team that I... Um, the only few teams I see that really aren't all that good. Um, there's teams that I think have more talent than others that have lower seeds than some seeds that have a, um, a higher seed number next to them. And by the way, the buys in each conference, Boston, Tampa, Washington, Philly, and St. Louis, Colorado, Vegas, and Dallas. So those... Eight are your buys, so your top two in every division, Boston and Tampa Bay in the Atlantic and Washington and Philadelphia in the Metro, the Blues and the Avs and the Central. Oh, wait a minute. 
I guess this is all points percentages. So much for the top two teams in every division has a bye because the Blues, the Avs, and the Stars are all in the same division. So maybe that I just thought that way for the East. So, so much for the top two in every division. So I, it should be the top four points getters in each conference have the buys. That makes more sense. So, um, so much for me thinking that uh, some worser teams uh, could be in the postseason. And then there's, it was just announced that the GMs are going to be on a league call at 3 o'clock Eastern time. So... That is very good. Um, some other sports news related to COVID. Um, NFL minicamps could be in June. Minicamps, could, including players, could be scheduled as early as June 15th or late as June 27th. That is significant, and this news obviously comes out the same day as Governor Murphy in New- here in New Jersey announces that um, sports can resume in the state and competition could resume as long as uh, their sports say so. So Governor Murphy following uh, Andrew Cuomo's footsteps there because Cuomo made the same similar type of announcement last week. And with the Jets and the Giants obviously being involved in New Jersey and they play in New Jersey at MetLife Stadium. Um, so I think there's no coincidence that Yahoo reported about the NFL minicamps could be in June. Um, the NBA, um, Damian Lillard came out today and said that uh, he doesn't plan to play in the resumed NBA season if the Blazers don't have the quote-unquote true opportunity to make the postseason. Well, what a fraud, Damian Lillard. I mean, I don't like calling players out on my podcast, but I'm going to do so. You were a part of that com- uh, committee that um, was full of superstars in the league that wanted the league to come back. I mean, like, I understand that the Blazers underachieved this season, but you were a part of that committee that wanted the league to come back. And to now turn your side and say uh, that um, you don't want to play if there's no playoffs? Like, come on. Um... But yeah, and this is in wake of the latest rumors that they are going to do a 1 through 16 playoffs. And there would be, regardless of conference, and this is what uh, a lot of people in the NBA wanted to do because of how weak the Eastern Conference is. So um, it makes sense to do that. And there's going to be some teams in the Eastern Conference that are, don't benefit from this, like the Brooklyn Nets, who may get Kevin Durant healthy. And the Orlando Magic, who've been an up-and-coming team in the East for um, two seasons now. So those would be the two losers there. And then the winners would be the the Pelicans with Zion. So are they doing that to get Zion in the postseason? That's going to be like the media slash fans of the Eastern Conference team's excuse for why they're doing just flat-out 1 through 16. Because if the Pelicans are a part of that, then everyone's going to say, oh, well, they're doing it solely because they want Zion in the postseason. I mean, I'm not fully buying that narrative, but it's interesting because Zion's obviously a superstar already, and he may very well steal Rookie of the Year away from John Morant if this um, if they are involved in the one through sixteen. Um, and then I think the Sacramento Kings would be involved potentially. I really don't know the Western Conference standings by heart, but I know that the Grizzlies were in the eighth spot in the Eastern Conference when the se- or in the Western Conference when season was stopped. But um the thing is that um maybe the Blazers would get in in the 1 through 16. But I have no idea how they would do it. Will they do it on like a winning percentage or record like It's interesting to see what they would do, but hockey had the points percentage thing, which was smart. They put uh, most of their, um, or I put it this way, least of their bottom, bottom feeder teams in there. So, like, the teams that are safe with this 16, 1 through 16, if, if they do it regardless of conferences, I think the Pacers would be safe. I think the Thunder would be safe, um... Miami would be safe. Philadelphia would be safe. Dallas is obviously safe. So, 
like I said, they're doing this because they clearly don't, um, they want to try something new and, um, not to see, um, the Orlando Magic get swept in the first round because that wouldn't, uh, feel like an accomplishment to them or whatever, but, um, I think it would be an accomplishment for Orlando to get to back to back pro season despite um not winning a series because they were in the abyss for a long time after trading Dwight Howard and it took them so long to get back to the postseason with and they finally put the right not really the right team together, but they um they certainly have enough talent to uh get into the postseason in a weak Eastern Conference if they still did the conference thing. So that's a TBD for the NBA. If I get more information regarding um, the NBA's restart, I'll certainly give it to you. Now I want to talk about the KBO. Um, I'm going to go over the results from a busy weekend, and we'll look at the updated standings, and we will look ahead to the games that will be played tomorrow morning. So we're going to start with um, Thursday, May 21st. Um, Hamlo over KT, 9-4. Kaiwum over SK, 9-8. Kia over Latte, 6-1. LG over Samsung, 2-0. NC over Doosan, 12-6. Friday, Hanlo over NC, 5-3. Kia over SK, 2-1. Latte over Kaiwum, 9-7. Doosan over Samsung, 12-7. LG over KT, 6-5. Saturday, KT over LG 6-2, Doosan over Samsung 10-6, NC over Hanwha 3-0, Kaiwum over Latte 12-4, and Kia over SK 8-3. Sunday, NC over Hanwha 10-5, Latte over Kaiwum 2-0, Samsung over Doosan 13-0, LG over KT 9-7, SK over Kia 4-3, and this morning... Doosan over SK, 6-4. Latte over Samsung, 1-0. Kia over KT, 4-1. LG over Hanwha, 3-0. And NC over Kaiwum, 7-2. Quick look at the standings. The Dinos are awesome. They're 15-3. LG is 12-6. Doosan, 11-7. Kia, 10-8. Or, I'm sorry, 11-8. Latte, 10-8. Kaiwum 10 and 9, KT 7 and 11, Hanwha 7 and 12, Samsung 6 and 13, and SK 3 and 15. So, NTA, the Dinos are clearly still the best team in the league, and SK is still clearly the very worst team in the league. And then tomorrow, um, Kaiwum versus NC, gotta go with the Dinos. They're riding it high right now. LG and Hanwha. Um, let's go with Hanwha at home. Um, in a little bit of an upset. LG is the second best team right now. But um, why not go with a little upset there? Kia and KT. Um, here I'm gonna go with Kia on the road. Samsung and Latte. Latte kind of fell off after a great start, so I think their record's a little deceiving. But I'm gonna take them here at home over Samsung. And SK and Doosan, um, we got to go with Doosan. I'm sorry. I can't pick SK under any circumstances right now to win any games. Unless, um, like, there's injuries on the one team. And I'm obviously going to do more research on the league now that we're about 20 games in. Because you need the 20-game sample size, and then I can do um, my numbers like I normally would in any other league, and try to create some uh, betting edges if uh, if there is any edges necessarily to bet on. NASCAR, um, it's back. Um, they obviously had the race on Wednesday night in Darlington, and then over the weekend they were in Charlotte, and they're still in Charlotte. Um, we're going to go over all the race results from... The past couple days, um, the most recent race, um, was the, um, 
Xfinity race, so I'll go over the results for that, but I wanted to do the, uh, the Cup Series race from Sunday night's results, um, from Charlotte, um, I really thought that Jimmy Johnson was going to win this race, um, this is his best track, um, he raced pretty well in, um, the race over the weekend, um, so here are the results, Brad Kozlowski won, Chase Elliott came in second, and by the way, Chase Elliott cost himself this race by going in pit road on the last restart. Had he not done that, he probably would have won. Ryan Blaney, third. Kyle Busch, fourth. Kevin Harvick, fifth. Martin Truex, Jr., sixth. Kurt Busch, seventh. Tyler Reddick, eighth. Tyler Reddick's been a really good rookie so far this season. Chris Bell, ninth. Chris Boucher, tenth. Eric Jones, eleventh. Cole Custer, twelfth. Joy Logano, thirteenth. Austin Dillon, fourteenth. Eric Amarola, fifteenth. John H. Nemechek, sixteenth. 17th, Matt DiBonetto. 18th, Michael McDowell. 19th, Alec Bowman. 20th, um, William Byron. Notables, Ryan Priest. 22nd, Ricky Stenhouse Jr. 24th. Ty Dillon, 25th. Matt Kenseth, 26th. Ryan Newman, 27th. So a couple big names there. Um, J.J. Yaley, 37th. Bubba Wallace, 38th. Clint Boyer, 39th. Guy into an accident in the race. And then, uh, Jimmy Johnson got disqualified in the race on Sunday night, so he finished in last. So that's unfortunate for Jimmy, who I really was uh, um, confident in in this race. He raced very well, and he got disqualified due to a car failed. Um, inspection. So the results from Monday night, which was last night for the Xfinity series, your winner was Kyle Busch. Um, Kyle Busch um, hasn't won a sprint cup race since uh, since the comeback, but he's been racing better, and um, so I'm not surprised he won this race. Daniel Hemrick, second. Austin Sindrick, third. Ross Chaston, fourth. Justin Allager, fifth. Brett Moffitt, sixth. Michael Annette, seventh. Brandon Brown, eighth. Harrison Burton, ninth. Um, Myatt Snyder, tenth. Noah Gregson, eleventh. Riley Herbst, twelfth. Dylan Bassett, thirteenth. Josh Williams, fourteenth. Jesse Little, fifteenth. Alex McLabby, sixteenth. BJ McLeod, seventeenth. Bailey Curry, eighteenth. Joe Graff Jr., nineteenth. Um... Chase Briscoe, 20th. Any other um, notables? Um, Jeffrey Earnhardt, 25th. I think he is related to Dale in some capacity. Um, Joe Nemechek, 26th. Um, and that's it for uh, for the notables. And um, the starting lineup for... Um, the race tonight, the, uh, the truck race... Ben Rhodes first, Tyler Ankrum second, Tanner Gray third, Matt Crafton fourth, Austin Hill fifth, Christian Eckel sixth, right, um, starting in seventh, Ty Majeski eighth, Johnny Sauter ninth, Grant Effinger tenth, Stuart Freyson eleventh, Todd Gilliland twelfth, Angela Rush thirteenth, Natalie Decker, so a couple females there, fourteenth, Jesse Awuji fifteenth, Austin Wayne Self. 16th, Kyle Busch. 17th, Tate Fogelman. 18th, Jordan Anderson. 19th, Spencer Boyd. 20th, Raphael Lassard. 21st, Sheldon Creed. 22nd, Brett Moffitt. 23rd, Corey Roper. 24th, Garrett Schmithley. 25th, Derek Krause. 26th, Chase Elliott. 27th, Ross Chaston. 28th, Spencer Boyd. 29th, Jennifer Jo Cobb. 30th, Zane Smith. 31st, Cody Rohrbrog. 32nd, Brendan Poole. 33rd, Timmy Hill. 34th, Corbin Forrester. 35th, Jesse Little. 36th, Brian Dawzat. 
Um, 37th, TJ Bell. 38th, John Hunter Nemechek. 39th, Clay Greenfield. And 40th, Ray Cirelli. Um, tough call here. I was thinking about Kyle Busch this whole time, but I talked myself into somebody else. I'm going to go with Chase Elliott. Um, he is somebody that obviously, um, as I mentioned in the top, pre or recapping the, uh, the Cup Series race, um, cost himself a win perhaps with going to Pitt Road. I think that he has a lot of motivation to race well. Granted, it's trucks. Um, he's a good driver, and I'm going to roll here with Chase Elliott for the win tonight in what should be a fun race in Charlotte in the North Carolina Education Lottery 200. So this is the uh, first truck race since February 21st, which is surreal. Now I want to talk about sports reruns that have been on lately. Um, last night on ESPN, they re-aired a Monday night football game between the Steelers and the Chargers. Ben Roethlisberger, Phil Rivers. The game ended on a game-ending touchdown by Le'Veon Bell. And the Steelers wound up getting the win. Um, it was a game I completely forgot about. It was a classic Monday night game between um, the two quarterbacks that were drafted in the same year. and he, As well as uh, Eli Manning was also drafted in that year. So the Charger Steelers matches we saw the most of like those three 2004 quarterbacks because they're in the same conference and still are in the same conference. So um, that was a really good game and a big win for the Steelers at the time as uh, they were going for a division title. Tonight on ESPN, they are re-airing the 2016 World Series Game 7 between the Cubs and the Indians. An all-time classic game, arguably the very best baseball game of the decade. In my opinion, the most important baseball game of the decade and perhaps the century because the Chicago Cubs broke their 108-year World Series championship drought. Well documented. You could argue the 2004 Red Sox was probably the most important um, World Series of the century, but I think this was a bigger deal because um, social media is bigger now and... If I'm not mistaken, the Cubs had a longer drought than the Red Sox did. And this was very important for the Cubs, and they got the job done. Um, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, they had co-World Series MVPs. Or that was in another series. I think Ben Zobrist was the World Series MVP for the Cubs that year, and he's still on the team, too. So that was obviously a great game. A lot of good baseball games have been on ESPN the last couple weeks. Obviously, last week was... Um, Arguably one of the better games of the decade, too. It's a toss-up for me. Um, I said it was easily the best baseball game of the decade, that Cardinals-Rangers um, game. But that this Cubs game with, with the Indians was arguably right up there as well. But I still say that Cardinals game was a better game. But the Cubs game 7 was a bigger game because it was the drought. It was a game 7. But the better game between the two, even though the Cubs game went extra innings with the Indians as well, and the Indians rallied back. But I think that Cardinals-Rangers game six was better only because the Cardinals rallied back multiple times in their home building. And then Joe Buck had the, I think his most important, uh, at the time his most important call of his career, honoring his late father. But I think um, obviously the Cubs one was important for Joe Buck as well. Um so that's a great game, obviously. Um, MLB Network's re-airing the 2004 NLCS Game 5 between, or 2014 Game 5 between the Cardinals and the Giants. That was when um, Travis Ishikawa hit the walk-off home run to send the Giants to the World Series. And coming on at 2 o'clock, Yankees-Mets Game 1 from Yankees Stadium. Mets um, had the lead and Yankees came back and got the win. Um, on right now on NHL Network, Eastern Conference Final Game 7, Lightning Penguins. So that was a good one, the Game 7 that um, Pittsburgh won to go on to the Stanley Cup Final as uh, Tampa was denied a chance to um, go to back-to-back -back finals 
And who knows, maybe they win a cup had they won that game seven. Um, you have tonight on NBC, I said the Kings against the Coyotes. Game five, so that was when the Kings clinched to go to the Stanley Cup final in 2012 when they won that game in overtime in Phoenix against the then Phoenix Coyotes. So, um, a lot of older games on M- uh, our NBA TV tonight. Um, game five, Sun Celtics triple overtime in 1976 in the finals, and that was obviously Celtics winning. That one, um, a lot of podcasts they have on, um, and at three o'clock today, um, they're re-airing a Spurs Pelicans game from this year that was on ESPN, where Zion Williamson made his NBA debut. Now I want to do my 2013 NFL redraft. Boy, have things changed. There's a lot of players in this redraft that had retired. So it's kind of unfortunate for um, some of uh, those selections that I made for teams, but those selections that I made to those players that have retired um, are um, showing that they would have brought, in, in all my opinion, bought a value to those teams I have picking those respected players. So without further ado, here we go, 2013 NFL Redraft. Number one, I have the Chiefs going with DeAndre Hopkins. Um, This was a tough call because there's a lot of good offensive linemen in the draft, but DeAndre Hopkins is a top wide receiver in the draft, and he would be the um, primary weapon for Patrick Mahomes for years to come. Two, the Jacksonville Jaguars go with Lane Johnson, the talented um, offensive lineman for the Philadelphia Eagles, Pro Bowler, Someone that helped him win the Super Bowl a couple years ago. So he obviously um, would have brought value to the Jags over the guy who they did take was a bust in Luke Jokel. And Kansas City took Eric Fisher. Not a bad pick. He's made a Pro Bowl. He's won the Super Bowl, obviously. And they extended him. He's a good player. Wouldn't consider him a bust. He was considered a bust early on, but I wouldn't consider him a bust right now because... Um, he's a solid lineman, but he's not a Pro Bowl lineman. So not a bust like Luke Jokel. The Miami Dolphins in number three have them taking Travis Kelsey. I did consider Kelsey to the Chiefs in a, uh, um, scenario in which the Chiefs pick a guy that, um, they already have. But I have them, uh, going with Hopkins instead, and I have the Dolphins going with Travis Kelsey. He would have been a good weapon for Ryan Tannehill at the time, and maybe he would have developed better in Miami if he had pieces like Kelsey around him. The Philadelphia Eagles at number four go with David Bakatari. Um, with Lane Johnson off the board, they go with Bakatari, um, who has really helped keep Aaron Rodgers upright these past seven years. Um, he certainly would have been good protection for Carson Wentz and whomever the Eagles had at quarterback before him. Um, and by the way, the Dolphins at number three took um, Deion Jordan, who was a major bust. The Lions at number five, I have them going with Teron Armstead, um, a solid lineman for the New Orleans Saints. Um, made the Pro Bowl the past couple of seasons. Um, very good player. Um, Someone who the uh, the Saints took in the third round came into his own in his last few years, and certainly would have helped kept uh, Matt Stafford upright in Detroit as well. And instead, I had them, or instead uh, they went with Ezekiel Ansa, who was a good player for them, who's currently a free agent. Um, the Browns at six, I have them going with Adam Thielen. It's amazing that Adam Thielen went undrafted, and now he's one of the more underrated receivers in the league. I think he's become very underrated because he didn't have that great of a season last year. And now um, um, he's being undervalued. And now uh, there's the perception that the Vikings traded away their best receiver and then, um, then they dropped his replacement. But I still think that Thielen 
is better than Stefan Diggs. Thielen, somebody that I felt wasn't healthy last year for Kirk Cousins. And I think he's poised for a monster year. And he'd be um, a great weapon for Baker Mayfield. He would replicate all of Odell's numbers, that's for sure. And instead, the Browns went with Barkavius Mingo, who was a bust. The Cardinals at 7, I have them going with Keenan Allen. This would have been a great pick for them here at 7. Um, he's a great receiver. I think he's the very most underrated receiver in the league. Um, was a big part of um, the Chargers' success the past couple years and um, is a part of their core. Um, really had good chemistry with Phillip Rivers. Um, he's somebody like T.Y. Hill, and I feel like his value is going to go down because of the quarterback downgrade. And meanwhile, with Rivers now in Indy, I think that T.Y. Hilton will have a good year. Um, and Keenan Allen would have been a productive guy to have for Carson Palmer when he was there, and he certainly would be a good weapon for Kyler Murray, too. And instead, the Cardinals go with Jonathan Cooper. The Rams at 8 go with Le'Veon Bell. It's amazing that Le'Veon F- Bell fell all the way to 8. I think it says a lot to um, the talent at the top of this redraft. Um, if they took him, maybe they would have never taken Todd Gurley. Um, um, Bell is somebody that I think is sort of on the decline. He's I don't think ever going to be the same guy he was in Pittsburgh unless Sam Darnold makes this monster leap. Um, so he certainly would have been a big help for, uh, Jared Goff, and maybe Jared Goff wouldn't have had that bad rookie season, because Todd Gurley wasn't Todd Gurley yet, at the time. Um, and instead the Rams went with Tavon Austin. The Jets at number nine go with Darius Slay. It's amazing that Darius Slay fell all the way to nine in this redraft, but like I said, it's because of the talent, um... Slay's a great player. Um, He'll help Philadelphia in what was their uh, weakest unit last year on defense. And um, he'll be missed by the Lions, that's for sure. And he certainly would have been the lockdown corner that the Jets desperately, desperately need. And instead, the Jets went with Dean Milliner, who was a major bust for them. The Tennessee Titans at number 10, I have them going with Travis Frederick, the recently retired center from the Dallas Cowboys. Um, He gave them a lot of value during his career. He certainly would have helped Tennessee's offensive line, regardless of who was at quarterback. And instead, the, uh, the Titans went with Chase Warmack, who's still in the league, actually. The Chargers at number 11 go with Tyron Matthew. Um, It's amazing that Tyron Matthew has fallen this far. Um, Currently on the Chiefs, um, was great on the Cardinals. Um, He was on the Texans for a year, um, wasn't really all that great. He helped the Chiefs this year in their Super Bowl run on their defense, and now um, he's still on their team. So um, He's someone that the Chiefs certainly value, and he certainly would have helped um, the secondary with the Chargers as well. The Raiders at number 12 go with Mika Hyde. It's amazing that Mika Hyde fell this far as well. Um, Mika's a great player. Um, He uh, really um, hit his peak once he went to Buffalo. Um, He was good on Green Bay, but he became better after he signed the free agent deal, which is crazy. It doesn't normally work that way, but it did for... uh, Mika Hyde, and he certainly be um, the best defensive back on the Raiders right now. And instead, the Raiders took DJ Hayden, who was a bust. The Jets at number 13 go with Kawan Short, um, underrated player on the Panthers. Um, he's somebody that um, is a good pass rusher. He certainly would have helped the Jets. Um, so the Jets in this redraft, Darius Slay and Kawan Short, who are certainly better players than the two guys they selected. But the guy that the Jets selected, 13th wasn't bad. It was Sheldon Richardson, who we'll get to in a couple minutes. But Kawan Short really would have helped them and would have given them a, a really good edge rusher, which they also lack. The Panthers at 14 go with Brandon Williams, an underrated player on the Ravens. Um, he's somebody that's come into his own lately. Um... And 
he really would have helped Carolina. And instead, the Panthers went with Star Ludolelli. The Saints at 15 go with Kyle Long. Um, maybe Kyle Long would have certainly helped out Drew Brees in that offensive line before they uh, ended up with some reinforcements in years down the road. Um, he's somebody that uh, had a great career at the Bears. Um, I thought it was underappreciated because the Bears were in so much um, disarray while Long was in his prime. So I just thought that Kyle Long was underappreciated on that Bears team, and he certainly would have helped Drew Brees as well. Instead, the Saints went with Kenny Vaccaro. The Bills at 16 go with Eric Fisher, so the number one overall pick falls to 16. He's someone that um, I talked about on the top of the show is solid, but is someone that uh, the Chiefs um, didn't really live up to the hype. Perceived as a bust, but I don't consider him one. He made a Pro Bowl and is somebody that's um, getting better. So, in other words, he's a late bloomer, and he helped the Chiefs win the Super Bowl this year because you need, in my opinion, you just need a good offensive line or at least a respectable one, to win the Super Bowl. And um, Fisher is somebody that certainly would help Josh Allen's development right now. And instead, Buffalo went with E.J. Manuel, who was a major bust. The Steelers at 17 go with Zach Ertz. Oh, my God. He would have been a major weapon for um, Big Ben and the Steelers. Maybe those first couple years, he... Um, wouldn't have started because Heath Miller was still on the Steelers back then. And then he retired, and then maybe Ertz becomes the star that he is on Philadelphia in um, a different city in the same state of Pennsylvania in Pittsburgh. So that would have been a great pick for Pittsburgh. It's amazing that he would have fallen the 17, Zach Ertz. Like I said, this draft um, was pretty loaded, and... Um, uh, now we're about to see the drop off as uh, it goes on. So um, the Steelers instead go with Jarvis Jones, who was a bust. The 49ers at 18 go with Xavier Rhodes. Xavier Rhodes isn't that great of a player anymore, um, but maybe in a new um, setting he'll bounce back. But um, Rhodes was a great player on Minnesota for a while, and then he really dropped off last year. I do think he's a bounce-back candidate, but he's certainly not going to be as good as he was in his peak. And he certainly would have helped those Niners teams with Jim Harbaugh there. And then, uh, and then he, they would have been, uh, he would have been in a bad spot uh, for his sake for those couple years before they got Jimmy Garoppolo. And instead, the Niners went with Eric Reed, who was a good player. The Giants at 19 go with Ezekiel Ansa. Someone who's a free agent right now, um, was a really good player on the Lions, helped the Seahawks last year. Um, he certainly would have helped the Giants pass rush for sure, alongside Jason Pierre-Paul there for a few years. Instead, the Giants go with Justin Pugh. The Bears at 20 go with Sheldon Richardson. So Richardson falls from 13 to 20. So with Kyle Long off the board, they address a different area. They go with an edge rusher instead. Um or defensive tackle, whatever you consider him, defensive lineman. Um, Richardson's a solid player. He's still in the league. He's on the Browns right now. He bounced around the last couple of years. Um, not as good as he was on the Jets, obviously, but he certainly would have helped Chicago those few years at the end of the Jay Cutler era. Instead, the Bears, like I said, go with Kyle Long, who was a great pick. The Bengals at 21 go with Desmond Trufant. Um, here I have them addressing the secretary of Trufant. It's incredible that... Uh, Atlanta cut Trufant. Um, I think they're going to end up regretting that one. Trufant's a good player, but he was just overpaid, so they had to cut him. Um, Trufant certainly was the best or one of the best um, defensive backs on that Falcons team that made the Super Bowl. Um, I do think he'll help the trade. He's not as good as Darius Slay, but he certainly can replicate some of the production, and he certainly would have helped out Cincinnati at the um, end of that Andy Dalton era there in Cincinnati. Um, instead, the Bengals went with Tyler Eifert, which was not a bad pick. We'll get to Eifert. The Falcons at 22 go with A.J. Boye. Um, 
amazingly falling to 22. Um, with True Final at the board, they go with Boye. Um, Boye is very good. Um, I think that Boye is somebody that um, is is very good. He probably should have gone higher than this. Um, he's somebody that um, I think Denver stole from Jacksonville. Uh, he'll certainly help the Broncos, and he would have really um, helped Atlanta too, providing them uh, Trufant's production. And Trufant is who obviously they took. The Vikings at 23 go with Jamie Collins. Um, Collins is somebody that um, um, thrived with the Patriots, um, was dealt to the Browns and really wasn't all that special, and then helped the Patriots after being uh, traded back there. Now he's on the Browns. The Browns, um, or I'm sorry, the Lions, my bad. Now he's on the Lions who uh, they're trying to uh, get all those Patriot players. He fits um, that Patricia's perception of stealing expatriates. And he certainly would have helped Minnesota's defense as well. Instead, Minnesota goes with uh, Sharif Floyd. The Colts at 24 go with Jordan Reed. So Jordan Reed um, is the selection here for uh, Indianapolis. Um, that's um, That would be a good pick. Um, he certainly would have helped Andrew Luck those couple years. But unfortunately for Jordan Reed, he had... A lot of concussion, so he never really fulfilled all of his potential. Um, the Vikings at 25 go with Kenny Vaccaro, um, who falls from 15 to 25. He certainly would have helped their secondary. Instead, they go with um, Xavier Rhodes, who did help them for a couple of years there, who I talked about earlier. And by the way, the Colts at um, 24 went with Bajorn Werner, who was a bust. 26, the Packers. Um, they go with Robert Woods here. Um, Robert Woods is the number now number two receiver on the Rams after the training of Brandon Cooks. Jared Goff got a lot out of him. Um, Robert Woods showed flashes in Buffalo, and then uh, I think Jared Goff really brought a lot of a lot of uh, talent out of Robert Woods. I think Aaron Rodgers would have done the same with the Packers, and he certainly would be good helping Aaron Rodgers stay. He'd probably be their number one receiver right now, or I'm sorry, number two. My bad, I forgot about Deontay, uh, Devontae Adams. So, yeah, he would have been certainly their uh, number two guy behind Devontae Adams. And instead, they go with the, the Tone Jones, who was a bust. The Texans at 27 go with Tyler Eifert. So, Eifert falls from 1 to 27. Eifert's been injury prone. That's why he's this low. But he certainly would have helped Deshaun Watson right now and would have helped the previous uh, Texans quarterbacks as well. Instead, Houston went with DeAndre Hopkins, who I had going number one in the redraft. Um... The Broncos at 28, I have them going with Larry Warford, who's currently a free agent right now. He certainly uh, would help a lot of teams. Um, really did bring some value with the Lions and the Saints, but the Saints had to cut him due to cap issues. And he certainly would have helped Denver in the Peyton Manning era. Instead, uh, they went with Sylvester Williams, who wasn't all that special. The Vikings at 29 go with Star Lutuelli. Um Former Panther now on the Bills. Um, solid player, but um, he's somebody that was really good his rookie year and then uh, really um, deteriorated from that, but still is a nice player. Um, and he would have been fine on Minnesota. And instead the Vikes go with um, Cotterell Patterson as they traded up to the Patriots about to get him as the Pats traded back. Um the Rams at 30 go with Justin Pugh, so Justin Pugh falls from 19 to 30. Um, Pugh is solid on the Giants, and then um, he wound up going to, I believe, the Arizona Cardinals, got overpaid, and um, really hasn't been all that special. You could argue he was a little overrated, but um, he had some good years on the Giants, and instead the uh, Rams went with Alec Ogletree. 31, the Cowboys go with um, Cotterell Patterson. So the Cowboys traded back as the Niners traded up in this draft. Um, Patterson really would have been a good special teams player for the Cowboys and the occasional um, random big play guy. For them, he'd be in that Tavon Austin role. But I just think Cardell Patterson's better than Tavon Austin. And the Ravens at 32 go with C.J. Anderson. Um... 
a really solid running back. Um, but he's had some weight issues and injury issues that is why teams are avoiding him. But he really helped Denver in their Super Bowl run. And then he really helped the Rams back up uh, for Todd Gurley a few years ago as well. Um, and instead, Dallas went with Travis Frederick, who was great for them. And then uh, the Rams went with Matt, or the Ravens went with Matt Alam at 32. And now I'm going to do my 2015 top 10 songs. I thought that. Uh, 2015 songs um, was a deep group. There's a lot of songs I liked, and there's so many of them that I liked that um, I put out to put a couple in honorable mentions. Um, honorable mentions: Wildest Dreams by Taylor Swift, "Watch Me" by Salento, which was uh, "Watch Me With," "Watch Me Nay Nay," "Fight Song" by Rachel Platten, and "The Hills" by The Weeknd are my. Honorable mentions. And now, without further ado, here are my um, top 10 songs of the calendar year 2015. In 10th place, I have Hello by Adele. Um, this song came out October 23rd, 2015, from her album 25. Um, almost a five minute song, very dark song, very soulful song, and certainly a um, somewhat emotional song as well. Ninth place, I have Bad Blood by Taylor Swift. Taylor Swift had a great 2015, as we'll get to, uh, obviously, my artists, which we'll do on Thursday's show. Um, this is featuring um, Kendrick Lamar off the album 1989. came out May 17th of 2015, so um, the first... Five year anniversary of the song was very recently. Very pop and hip hop y kind of song. And it is um, a three minute, 19 minute song. Eighth place How Deep Is Your Love by Calvin Harris and the Disciples. Came out July 20th, 2015. Three and a half minute long ish kind of song. Very hip hop y, deep. Um. Dancy kind of song. And it, this is obviously a uh, just a single, not really from an album per se. Seventh place. See You Again, Wiz Khalifa featuring Charlie Puth from the album Furious 7, the original motion picture soundtrack, picture soundtrack, and nine track Mind. Um, came out March 10th of 2015. Three minutes and 49 seconds long. It's hip-hop, pop rap, but it's slower, which makes the song uh, really uh, different and unique in so many different ways. Sixth place, Can't Feel My Face, The Weeknd. The Weeknd had a lot of great songs in 2015, but this one I thought was their best. Um... Off the album Beauty Behind the Madness, released June 8, 2015. Three minutes and 35 seconds long. Um, a pop disco funk type of song. Fifth place. Sugar by Maroon 5. Um, very cute song. January 13, 2015. It was released from the album V. Um... Three minutes and 55 seconds long. Um, very disco, soulful, and uh, funk pop. They performed this a, a, a part of their uh, Super Bowl halftime show performance as well. Fourth place. Sorry, Justin Bieber off the album Purpose came out October 22nd of 2015. Very... Um, Dancy kind of song, um, uh, tropical house and moon Botten type of song as well. Um, very fun song. And then in third place, 
What do you mean, Justin Bieber? Also from the album Purpose, came out August 28, 2015. Um... Very pop song, Tropical House, 3 minutes 27 or 26 seconds long. So back-to-back -back Justin Bieber songs for my number four and number three songs, respectively. Second place on the list. Style, Taylor Swift, off the album 1989. Song was released February 9th, 2015. Um... Disco, funk pop, pop rock, synth pop type of song. Almost four minutes long. Um, it's very cute as well. And my number one song of 2015 is... Homegrown, Zach Brown Band. Um, the lead single off their album, Jekyll and Hyde. Such a great song. Came out January 12th. 2015 country rock and southern rock type of song um i've seen zach brown live before and they do this song very well live and obviously this song is used in college game day on espn as they go in and out of commercial breaks so this is a very popular song three minutes and 25 seconds long and it's one of the best country songs over the last five years, in my opinion. So, my top song of 2015, Homegrown, by the Zac Brown Band. And that's it for the show today. Tomorrow is a very busy show. Latest coronavirus news, we'll talk about what Gary Bettman said. Any MLB, NBA, NFL-related COVID news I'll have for you. I'll make a pick for the Charlotte race tomorrow, and then we'll recap the truck race for tonight and then KBO as well. I'll do my latest MLB mock draft. I haven't done that in two weeks. I will also be doing my 2015 top 10 movies and my 2013 MLB redraft as well. Hope you guys have a great day, everyone.